At the National Institute of Dramatic Arts, NIDA, a tradition is observed. When the final year students put on a performance, alumni are invited to attend. Afterwards, at a social gathering, aspiring actors, designers, and other theater professionals have the opportunity to mingle with both well-known and lesser-known celebrities. This allows them to receive constructive feedback on their work and make valuable connections for their future careers. In this way, the actress communicated with recent graduates. Her name is not important and will remain anonymous. They exchanged words after the show. She reminisced about her last visit here over a decade ago and felt a sense of satisfaction. The years that followed had been good to her. Local fame opened doors to Hollywood opportunities, allowing her to be selective with her roles. Now she was in a position where she was treated with respect and could choose which projects to take on. Despite the many requests to meet her, she remained focused on the purpose of her invitation and made an effort to connect with the cast and crew. As she mingled, a young woman in her early twenties introduced herself as Sarah, the set designer, and was praised for her creative use of space and versatile sets. Just as she was about to move on, the girl leaned in and asked if she would join her father for dinner that evening. She responded with a smile. Many people want to have dinner with me. Here is my agent's contact information. He wants you to contact him. His name is Mr. X. But the actress couldn't move when she heard that name. After all this time, her worst fears were. Oh no. The man has a grown-up daughter. It can't be that bad, right? Surely he wouldn't expect anything inappropriate if his child is part of the equation. She could never forget how grateful she was to him. It was his idea for her to pursue acting, something she had never considered before. At the time, she was studying economics when he came into her life. But after he suggested it, she quickly enrolled in Nidu and never once regretted it. She had always viewed this man as a potential threat. Why? Because he was a client. Only once. But that was all it took to make her wary. The actress couldn't help but think about the contingency plan she had created over the years just in case someone like him ever became a problem. The mere thought of her past is enough to put her on high alert, ready to defend herself at any moment. She knows she has the strength to survive it, but she also knows it's a battle she doesn't want to face. What's the harm in having dinner with this guy? Besides, ever since their first and only meeting, she has been consumed by curiosity, desperate to uncover the truth behind it all. Yes, she'll do it. What could go wrong? She inquired about the location and time of the meeting with this mysterious Mr. X. The designated place was a restaurant nearby her hotel. An hour passed by as she talked. Then she returned to her hotel room, took a refreshing shower, and swapped outfits. While riding in the limo, she made two phone calls. First to her lawyer, then to her husband. Once her husband found out about the 14-year-old mystery, he insisted that she call him immediately with an update. After a short walk to the restaurant, she was escorted to a private room where she put on a brave front to mask her true nerves. Her lawyer had already obtained the name of the man's daughter. The private room's door creaked open, and the actress felt a wave of relief wash over her. Sarah was sitting next to another girl who seemed slightly younger. The actress's eyes then landed on a man in his forties, whom she vaguely remembered from a brief meeting fourteen years ago, Mr. X. There was also a woman at the table who appeared to be the same age as him. As Mr. X stood up and greeted her by shaking her hand, he introduced himself as David Brown before introducing his wife and daughters. After the group finished their meal and the women asked the usual questions about being a celebrity, Dave signaled for everyone to quiet down. He shared that now that his youngest daughter, Wendy, had reached the age of 18, he could finally tell a certain story. But he made it clear that this was only his perspective, and he was grateful that the actress had joined them to confirm some of the details. The actress glanced at the two girls and noticed their eager expressions. Then she realized that she too was sitting on the edge of her seat in anticipation. She put on a smile, willing herself to relax. It was clear that Dave was nervous, and only his wife Mary seemed at ease. 
She held on to her husband's hand tightly, giving him a reassuring squeeze as he turned towards her before facing the audience again to continue his speech. Dave had two main reasons for sharing his strange story. First, he wanted to keep his promise to the actress and alleviate her fears about the events that happened 15 years ago. He gestured towards her, reassuring her that there was nothing that could harm her reputation. She nodded gratefully at him. Secondly, he had to finally explain to his daughters why they hadn't seen their biological mother in over 14 years. He had always planned on telling Sarah when she turned 18, but she never asked about it until now. He praised Mary, saying she was all his daughters needed. Then he explained that by sharing this story, he was asking for their forgiveness for his past actions without consulting them. With Mary there to hear it, Dave began at the very beginning. Meanwhile, miles away on the other side of the country, a woman lay in bed at a rundown motel. The sound of her companion snoring filled the air as she contemplated the mistakes that led her to this point. She couldn't help but think that this was not the life she was meant for. Growing up in a privileged middle-class family, she never had to struggle for anything. With ease, she obtained a college degree and teaching certification. And yet, here she was, stuck in a cheap motel with a man who resembled a pig. It made her wonder if her comfortable upbringing had given her a false sense of entitlement to indulge her every desire. Thanks to my dad's connections, I landed a job at a reputable school right out of the gate instead of having to start at bottom-tier institutions. For five years, I never stuck to one hobby, activity, or relationship. In fact, I relished in trying out everything life had to offer. I wasn't afraid to dip my toe into any pond that caught my interest. But as I approached 28 years old, my dad pleaded with me to settle down and focus on something meaningful. At that time, he held a high position as an assistant to a federal senator and understood deep down that he would never surpass his current rank. Perhaps he hoped to see me succeed where he could not, or perhaps he recognized potential in me that I was unaware of. He lured me in with tales of the influence his boss possessed. Together, we devised a plan for me to become the first female prime minister of our country within the next two decades. The strategy included achieving success in my career, starting a family, joining a political party, becoming more involved in the mainline church, and participating in charitable work, among other things. With my newfound determination, everything felt more achievable. It was through a church committee that I met the man who would become my husband, although not in the way most people would assume. I had requested for some antique woodwork to be redone to reduce noise in a side room of the church. As I called out to get the attention of a worker who was kneeling with his back to me, he stood up and turned around, flashing a charming smile. The masculine scent of him filled my senses, awakening a primal response within me. After less than a year, we were married. He may have been a simple cabinet maker, but his honest trade provided us with enough to afford a beautiful house in the most coveted neighborhood. My involvement in the local liberal party connected me with influential members who helped me secure a position as deputy director, then eventually director, at an exclusive all-girls school. I had held this position for two years before I made the biggest mistake of my life. It was a significant accomplishment, especially considering that I had taken two 12-month leaves to care for my daughters after their births. Sarah was born in the year 1998, and Wendy, two years later. Although I wanted to return to work and my busy schedule on various committees and fundraising efforts just three months after each birth, my father advised me to wait a full year. He believed that society would judge me primarily as a mother, above all else. The story truly began when Sarah was six years old and Wendy was four. We upgraded from a good house to an even better one. I held a successful position as a headmistress and led multiple charitable organizations. The local church practically relied on me. But the most exciting news of all was that I was the favored candidate for our party's ticket in the upcoming state election, just two years away. My schedule was constantly packed, but in a good way. I had three or four committee meetings every week, along with fundraising and hosting church dignitaries. And through it all, I had to maintain a poised appearance and be camera ready at a moment's notice. Thankfully, Dave was there to support me. 
He had the flexibility of being self-employed and could start his work as early as needed, allowing him to pick up our girls from school and daycare in the afternoons while I attended evening events. In all fairness, he also spent most weekends taking care of the children. I would often be preoccupied or unwinding from a busy work week. It was my New Year's resolution, the year my marriage ended, to dedicate more time to Dave and our daughters. But after being absent for so much of their childhood, I couldn't shake the feeling of being an outsider. And yet, another responsibility pulled me away from them once again. On top of my usual duties, I was also required to keep up with my teaching accreditation. This meant attending two conferences each year. In that particular year, I accidentally forgot to tell Dave about the second conference until the last minute. Little did I know, he had already arranged for a babysitter for the entire weekend, hoping to plan a romantic getaway for us and bring us closer together again. Although he was disappointed when I informed him of my other commitments, I knew he would eventually move on. This was his usual reaction whenever things didn't go as planned. The conference required me to be away on Friday and Saturday evenings, so I assured him we would have our own celebration on Sunday night. However, he didn't appear too thrilled and barely spoke to me until I left. As I walked away, I made a promise to myself to be more empathetic in similar situations going forward. Getting divorced now would be catastrophic. Strangely, Dave didn't reach out on Friday evening as he usually did. I figured he was still upset with me. But when he called on Saturday, I thought maybe he had finally gotten over it. It was getting pretty late, well past dinner time, when the phone started to ring in the next room. As soon as the call ended, I realized that my situation was challenging but not without hope. Looking back now, I see that my fate had been determined at that moment, with only one small chance for a different outcome. The conversation began as usual with us exchanging pleasantries and asking about each other's day. I was preoccupied with something else, and it was getting late, so I tried to wrap up the conversation quickly. The wine I had with dinner may have influenced my current state. Let it be known that I am certainly not inebriated, as anyone who knows me would attest to. But the slurred words and blurry vision could definitely be attributed to the alcohol. I think we should probably stop talking, Dave. The first seminar begins bright and early tomorrow at 8 a.m. Great. Let the girls know I was thinking of them. Of course, I'll kiss them for you, too. Consider it done. Give my regards to Alan. Okay, I will. After that, the buzzer sounded. Oh, I completely forgot to mention Alan. He's been my lover for almost a full year now. It wasn't something I had planned on, but looking back, it seemed like the natural thing to do. Alan was employed by a PR firm hired by the party to promote and support me. We had a close working relationship. He took charge of scheduling my media meetings and managing my public image. One weekend, after a successful sponsorship deal for charity, we ended up becoming intimate. I was in high spirits and had too much to drink, and one thing led to another. The next day, I was filled with fear at the thought of potential consequences if our affair was discovered. My political dreams came crashing to an end. I was on high alert for the next few days, worried that news of my downfall would leak, but nothing was said. I started to relax, thinking the worst had passed, but the situation didn't stop there. Alan, with his youth, attractiveness, and passion in the bedroom, became a temptation that I couldn't resist. The thrill and slight danger added to the excitement of our relationship. Honestly, I never considered ending things, even after a year, the passion between us remained strong, possibly because we only saw each other every couple of weeks. I worked tirelessly for years and felt entitled to some indulgence. I never thought about how hard Dave worked on the family side. It never even crossed my mind. While I wasn't born with a sense of entitlement, I'm sure I've picked it up along the way. That night, Alan was sitting on my bed without any clothes on while I talked to Dave over the phone. He witnessed the shock on my face and how I was at a loss for words. We both agreed that this was the biggest problem we'd ever faced. Before I could continue wondering aloud about how we got caught, Alan interrupted me. I'm not unintelligent, and I've always been exceedingly cautious. Before every date, I would mentally go through a checklist to ensure everything was in place. We had to meet outside of our city. I had to wear a disguise, and Dave's location had to be known. 
whenever we went out of town, we made sure to book separate rooms with connecting doors. One thing was definite. When I came home to my husband, there were no traces of Alan on me, not a scent, taste, or any physical evidence. I was aware that if Dave ever suspected me of having an affair, Alan would be the first person he'd suspect. So whenever we were together, we took extra precautionary measures, except for that one weekend. Since the trip wasn't strictly business-related, Alan didn't have to come with me. I knew Dave would be at Sarah's soccer final all weekend, so I didn't expect him to show up. As long as I was cautious when sneaking Alan in and out of my room, I felt secure. Or so I thought. But Dave's casual remark and my accidental admission, possibly due to the wine or Alan keeping me up all night, struck me to my core. It took me a moment to remember that I had a backup plan in place. Even though it was late, I still called my dad and he immediately contacted his lawyer. Looking back, I realized that I probably could have handled things differently. Instead of staying out all night and confessing to Dave about my affair, I should have gone straight home, ended things with the other person, and begged for Dave's forgiveness. He valued family above all else. After all, it was just one mistake. It's impossible for me to say whether the brutal attack from Dave was bound to happen or if my reaction to being caught instigated it. Dad was appalled by my actions and scolded me for giving Dave the opportunity to ruin all of my hard work. He insisted on booking me a flight back home and told me to pack my belongings and make my way to the airport. Alan's response to the situation surprised me, although perhaps it shouldn't have. In order to justify my actions, I had pretended to have strong feelings for him. The way he reacted showed me just how much he cared for me. It was heartbreaking to see him pleading with me to leave my husband and be with him. It made me consider it, but only briefly. I couldn't deny that I loved Dave and not him. Of course, I loved him deeply. The attention and adoration from a younger man was certainly flattering. And there was something exhilarating about having a secret lover. Leaving my husband for him is out of the question. Not only would it ruin any chance of salvaging my career, but having a partner who is a decade younger and who caused the downfall of my marriage would also make me a laughingstock. Still, I couldn't help but feel guilty for leading him on and making him fall for me. As a gesture of goodwill, I promised to visit him once things at home had settled down. My husband threatened to use this knowledge as leverage, so I have to tread carefully. Without getting into too many specifics, my father, his attorney, my sister, and I arrived at our family's estate just as Dave and the kids were about to leave for the zoo on a Sunday morning. My sister took over watching the girls while we convinced Dave to come back inside the house. Exhausted and unprepared, I left the conversation up to my dad and his lawyer. At first, my dad was hesitant about my decision to partner with a simple merchant. But Dave's friendly nature quickly won him over. Over time, they developed a great relationship and even became something like friends. When faced with the decision between supporting me or maintaining his friendship with Dave, my father didn't hesitate to choose a side. Although I couldn't help but feel sympathy for Dave's recent attack, my father wasted no time in discussing expectations. He brought up the fact that Dave likely expected me to be loyal, which may have been an unrealistic expectation considering our differing social classes, income levels, and accomplishments. I couldn't believe my father would bring this up so nonchalantly. The pain of what I had done to my husband was evident, and it tore at me. I searched for Dave's eyes, hoping to convey my regret. But he remained stunned and stared blankly at the table in front of him. At least it wasn't directed towards me. There were talks of silencing orders, legal injunctions, and lawsuits over false accusations and slander. But Dave showed no emotion, as if he had been completely numb by the whole situation. My father had also asked for evidence of my supposed infidelity. Upon questioning, he admitted that he didn't actually have any proof. It wasn't until I accidentally revealed my affair on Saturday night that he became sure of it. Looking back, I realized that all the precautions I had taken to hide the truth were ultimately futile. It turns out that Dave's friend overheard Alan boasting about sleeping with me and warned Dave about it. Dave couldn't believe it, but he decided to throw out a casual, say hi to Alan for me, in order to see what kind of reaction he would get. 
The shock I must have caused him when I responded with such indifference weighed heavily on my conscience. Unfortunately, my father did not seem to have that same moral burden. He asked the lawyer to leave, and then hinted at the possibility of creating fake evidence of Dave's infidelity in order to protect my reputation. Strangely enough, Dave showed no response to this suggestion. I had believed he was detached and unemotional, until the lawyer returned with news about the custody battle. According to him, the mother always got full custody while the father was only allowed to see his children every other weekend. I couldn't bear to watch as his expression turned to stone, so I looked away. It was unbearable to think that he would have limited access to his beloved daughters. He adored his daughters and dedicated all of his spare time to raising them. This allowed me to be away from home frequently without worrying about their well-being. But when the confrontation with Dave occurred, my father made it clear that the girls and I would stay with him for a few days as a reminder for Dave to fall in line. We were set to return on Tuesday night, just in time for our annual masquerade ball. My father assumed that by then, Dave would act as if nothing had happened and not cause any disturbances at such an important event meant to showcase our seemingly perfect family dynamic. Before I left, my dad made one final promise to Dave. He would financially support me while ensuring that Dave had limited access to quality legal advice. My relationship with my husband may have been in shambles, but my relationship with my dad was completely destroyed. As I walked out the door, Dave's devastated expression nearly made me happy if it weren't for the guilt weighing on my conscience. I hugged him from behind as he sat in the chair and whispered, Everything will be fine, dear, but received no response. After we were out of earshot from his lawyer, my dad grabbed me and pulled me away from my book. He seemed to be releasing some built-up tension from what he had just done to a man he admired. He reminded me that if Dave ever discovered any signs of wrongdoing on my part, it would be the end of everything. I assured him that I was careful enough to avoid that scenario. When the girls and I came back home on Tuesday night, they were greeted with open arms. But my welcome was much colder. I anticipated a tense homecoming and considered delaying it, but two things compelled me to go through with it. First, my dad was going on his annual fishing trip the next day, where he and three friends would disconnect from the world for a week. And secondly, preparations needed to be made for the Saturday night party at our house. Dave barely acknowledged my arrival. Once the girls were asleep, I took a deep breath and apologized to Dave for my affair. He didn't say anything and simply stood up, heading off to the guest room on the first floor where he was staying. Through the closed and locked door, I tried to calm him down and reassure him that I would end things with Alan immediately. But after receiving multiple phone calls from Alan over the past two days and seeing his strong emotional attachment to me, I realized that ending things wouldn't be so simple. Unlike Dave, Alan didn't have anything to lose or prove in this situation, making him a potential threat to my career. I couldn't simply blame him outright. It would cause too much damage. So, for the time being, I decided to continue seeing him but end things as soon as I could guarantee my safety. To make things more difficult for him, I continued sleeping with him but acted cold and distant, hoping he wouldn't enjoy my company anymore. I tried to explain this plan through his locked door, along with my intention to stay home next Monday to see Alan. But there was no response or any indication that he understood. I have no idea if he got the message or not. But at that moment, I didn't have time to dwell on it. Preparing the house for our annual masquerade party was my top priority. For the past eight years, we've hosted this event in our mini mansion, not tied to any specific occasion, but simply to impress influential members of the community and showcase our perfect family dynamic. My father was always absent because he didn't want me to live in his shadow. But with the help of some experts, I successfully transformed this event into a highly coveted social gathering. We had a skilled DJ and an open dance floor. The house was adorned with decorations and the drinks were plentiful. We were selective with our guest list, carefully considering each invitation. Each participant had their own connections and potential to help advance my career, making it crucial for me to secure their full involvement. Over the next few days, my top priority was ensuring that Dave would not only attend, but also actively participate in this important event. 
after some reluctance, he finally agreed to do so, bringing a sense of relief. But our interaction ended there with no further progress made. Most of the time, he barely acknowledged my existence. But I couldn't let it bother me too much. Organizing the party without Dave's assistance was enough to keep me busy all day. By the time Saturday evening rolled around, I was completely drained from wearing masks all week. It's no wonder I ended up drinking too much. To calm my nerves before Alan's arrival, I sipped on two glasses of wine. As always, he was there, overseeing my public image. It was a constant effort to keep him and Dave from crossing paths. I can still recall the moments of greeting every guest as they arrived at the front door. As the hostess, I wanted to make a lasting impression. It was a masquerade ball, but I didn't want anyone to question who was in charge. Among the attendees were members of my school board, the local bishop, politicians from the area, and influential party members. There were even two judges in attendance. After everyone had settled into their seats, the serving staff began to bring out the food. I recall how we all chatted and socialized while waiting in line for our portions of the expertly roasted pig. I usually stayed on edge during these types of gatherings. They were too significant to let my guard down. The atmosphere was particularly tense tonight because Dave and Alan couldn't be in the same vicinity. Finally, after about two and a half hours, Dave broke the tension by offering me a glass of punch. His quiet suggestion of adding vodka to help me relax made me feel cared for. I saw it as a peace offering and accepted the drink, despite my reluctance. I had already surpassed my self-imposed limit for drinking, but Dave's gesture was too kind to turn down. The next thing I remember is waking up the following day in my bed with a pounding headache, the events of the previous night, a hazy blur. As soon as I was able to stand up, my head throbbing, I searched for Dave and made sure to assure him that I had not made a fool of myself. He said that I had been talking an hour before the party ended, but after that, he found me asleep on our bed. Luckily, everyone was having too much fun to notice my absence. He told me nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Feeling relieved, I looked for my phone to call and make amends for missing our church service. We searched for him everywhere, but he was nowhere to be found. We had gotten rid of our landline a while back, so we couldn't even call him. I stayed in bed all day, trying to ease the pounding in my head and managed to doze off. After sleeping for most of the day, I woke up at 5 a.m. feeling refreshed and ready to start the day. My eyes were clear and bright, and I was eager for a cup of coffee. As I got up from bed, I noticed that the light was on in the kitchen and saw Dave sitting at the table. As I entered the room, he remained still and unmoving. I leaned down to kiss the top of his head before we began our conversation, of which below is what I can recall. Since then, he has refused to speak to me directly. What are you doing up so early? I asked him but his expression conveyed disbelief. Since discovering that the woman I adored and trusted had betrayed me, I haven't been able to sleep. In hindsight, I should have responded calmly to her confession, but I couldn't control my outburst. The pent-up guilt from days of avoiding confrontation, combined with frustration over losing a day in bed without any recollection of the party, led to my breaking point. Isn't it you who always says not to worry about things beyond our control? My father had once explained how the future would unfold, but his words now seemed irrelevant in the midst of this betrayal. Accept the situation and move forward. Dave remained still in his seat, but his tone was sharp and angry. His intense gaze fixed on me, almost piercing through me. What did you say? He lapsed into silence, struggling to keep his composure as the idea of being a cuckold sank in. I tried to soothe him with words. Just a moment, my love. It will pass quickly and you won't even notice it. It dawned on me that I would be coming back home late, as I am currently seeing Alan. Dave's sudden jump from his seat caused the chair to fall backwards with a loud noise. In the brief moment that followed, the previously noisy room fell silent. Dave stood with his arms tightly folded across his chest, a stark contrast to the chaos just moments before. I watched as he clenched and unclenched his fists the sound of fabric rustling filling the room. If I hadn't trusted my dad's precautions, I might have been genuinely worried. Dave went beyond just angrily hissing and seemed to practically spit his words out. 
How could you even suggest that I would willingly live a life of humiliation? He was a man who had given up his sense of pride and freedom. And as for you, your father lives by the belief that if you have someone in your grasp, their loyalty will surely follow. But I am not like him. I never will be. As he spoke these words, he set off on his usual morning run. I took a seat and pondered his words. Had I overlooked something? Did he have any other option but to adapt to the changing times? I couldn't see one. With a shrug, I resumed my search for my phone, determined to find it this time. Eventually, I discovered that my phone had died, so I plugged it in to charge. Trying to make amends with Dave, I took the time to prepare Sarah's school lunch before getting ready for work. By the time he came home, the kids were already awake and we didn't have a chance to talk further. I left for work without hugging them, not knowing what would happen that day and in the days to come. If only I had known. Now you know what your mother did to me. But it is imperative that you understand my actions and motives. Ironically, it was Martha's father and lawyer who convinced me to make a decision. They painted such a clear picture of the obstacles they had placed in my way that I didn't even consider attempting to flee. They believed there was only one acceptable option for me, but it didn't align with my beliefs. They were law-abiding individuals who couldn't fathom the path I wanted to take. So what did you do, Dad? I'll explain. Listen, Alan's company no longer supports or represents me. If this information becomes public, it could damage my chances of being chosen for the pre-selection process. What exactly happened? What am I accused of doing to Alan? They haven't informed me yet. There's nothing questionable about my actions, my dear. I have footage of him being publicly humiliated in front of a crowd, targeting his masculinity. If you need proof, I can show you the security tape. But I swear, I had nothing to do with it. I'm sorry, but I have to leave now. It's 10.23 in the morning. What are you hiding from me? I can see that you are hiding something from me. The diocesan secretary just contacted me and asked me to recuse myself from all the church committees I'm on. I couldn't believe it when they told me I was resigning not just from my position as chairman, but from all committees. They didn't give a reason. What happened on Saturday night? Did something happen after I had too much to drink? I heard the bishop ordered his followers to remove you from the church premises as fast as possible because he caught you and that man in our downstairs bathroom. Do you understand? What happened? I apologize. I have to go. The clock read 10.42 a.m., and I felt a wave of guilt wash over me. I had just checked my phone and saw that half of my friends had called, scolding me for my actions and asking how I could have treated you so poorly. What should I do now, Dave? I couldn't make out their conversation. It's hard to say, darling. Perhaps they were discussing your risque dancing or even insinuating that you were practically having intercourse on the dance floor with that man. They seemed a bit uncomfortable when they witnessed it. Or maybe it was because they asked me why I didn't intervene, and I told them how you demanded the right to be unfaithful with other men and threatened to destroy our family if I spoke out against it in public. Did you really say that? Yes, I did. You and my father thought you had backed me into a corner, forcing me to play along with your immoral and cruel schemes. But I found a different path, and the only price I paid was a bit of public embarrassment, and it was worth it. Tomorrow's paper will bring a lot of shame upon me. But Dave, when I asked you on Sunday if I acted appropriately during the time I can't recall, you assured me that I did. But darling, you may have only heard what you wanted to hear. What I truly stated was that your behavior wasn't unusual, and I still stand by that. I strongly believe that all promiscuous individuals behave in this manner. I can't believe I let myself lose control like that. Can you please call the bishop and others to explain that it wasn't really me? That I have a tendency to lose control when I drink too much? Why would I do this for you, my dear? Because you are my husband, and husbands always stand up for their wives. Just like how you stood up for me against your father and his enforcer, when they threatened to harm me if I didn't allow you to sleep with other men. Hey, Dave, you know it wasn't my intention to hurt you. I made a mistake and did my best to prevent any repercussions. 
I had only been with Alan once before and was considering doing it one or two more times at most. Dave, can you swing by the house at some point so we can have a chat? I'll only be another hour at work. The student council president wants to meet with me. I can sense the topic she wants to discuss. She was present at the meeting on Saturday night, along with most of the board. Do you recall? I don't believe your chances are very good. Wasn't she involved in a messy divorce a few years ago? When did she discover her husband's infidelity? I had just returned home after giving interviews to a local newspaper and television network, where I also provided them with this CCTV footage. Now, if there are no other matters that require my attention, dear, I need some time to contemplate what aspect of your life I have yet to completely ruin. I went to work and later picked you girls up from school. When we arrived home, it was clear that your mother had come back briefly, grabbed some clothes, and left in a rush. She didn't even bother to close the front door behind her when she left. She fled to another state and hid out with her sister. It took several months before she was willing to show her face in public again. But by then, it was too late. The judge had already made the decision that she had abandoned our family home, and I was granted full custody of our children. I couldn't help but wonder why her father didn't step in to assist her during this difficult time. I don't want to discuss it. After he returned from his fishing trip, he called me once to make a threat, but that was it. From what I gathered, his boss gave him an ultimatum. Either cut ties with his own child or quit his job. In the end, he chose to resign. I'm not sure if he couldn't afford lawyers or if they advised him it was a lost cause, but his legal team never contacted us again. I feel a little ashamed to admit it, but even when he passed away from a heart attack about a year later, he was still pleading with me to let him see his granddaughters. At the same time, your biological mother also asked me several times to bring you girls to where she was hiding. But by then, I had met Maria, the only mother you remember, and I didn't want to confuse you. From what I heard, she got mixed up with some bad company after that and I lost touch with her. If you want, I can try to locate her contact information for you. The actress became the center of attention. Ladies, based on what your father just disclosed, I have a feeling I know what took place and the reason he invited me here today. He had promised to reveal the whole truth on one occasion. Surprisingly, it hasn't been uncovered by the paparazzi yet. Before I proceed, please promise to keep everything I say here confidential. After receiving nods of agreement from everyone in the room, she went on, Acting was never something that crossed my mind until your father brought it up. As an orphan, financial struggles were a constant burden during college. That's when I turned to escorting for high-end clients. It was a friend who introduced me to the opportunity. Before you judge me, let me clarify. When I say escort, I mean it in the traditional sense. All I did was accompany men to various events. It could be a dinner with colleagues or simply keeping a lonely businessman company for the day. Some girls may have gone further for monetary gain but the agency I worked for did not condone such actions. Luckily, my appearance and outgoing personality were enough to make me a highly sought-after companion. One day my agents arranged a meeting between me and a man named Mr. X, your father. We only met once, but he told me that I would come to him for a specific purpose. I've always wondered why he picked me. She turned to Dave with curiosity in her eyes. Why did he choose me? she asked. He shrugged nonchalantly. I searched through countless escort sites until I found someone who resembled my ex-wife enough to pass at a masquerade ball. Originally, I was going to say no. However, your father's generous offer convinced me to take the risk. I wasn't going to budge, but then he mentioned that my boyfriend could also come with me to the masquerade. In the end, I couldn't resist. The actress took a moment to take a sip from her drink before continuing. Your father had led us into the party, and as soon as we arrived, he handed me a dress and a mask. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I felt it was important for everyone to know the entirety of what happened. The atmosphere was lively, and most of the guests were in high spirits. My contribution of two bottles of vodka to the punch bowl probably helped with that. It amused me to see her attempt to play the role of a perfect housewife, yet she always positioned herself between me and her partner. I noticed how she constantly had a drink in her hand, 
so I waited for the opportune moment to give her the medication. I crushed three sleeping pills and slipped them into her glass while casually mentioning the vodka. It took about ten minutes for the effects to kick in, and then I carefully guided her to our bedroom. After a few minutes, she fell into a deep sleep. I carefully removed her dress and mask, making sure not to wake her. Before leaving, I spritzed a light amount of her signature perfume on her neck and face. The actress gave a small nod before resuming her story. The dress was slightly ill-fitting, but no one seemed to notice. As a final touch, I put on my own mask and sprayed a bit of the same perfume as hers on myself. I had assumed that your father would escort me to the party, and Kent and I would have a good time, but things took an unexpected turn. Your father instructed us to enjoy ourselves and act as if we were a couple, but not engage in any conversations. It was difficult to follow that last rule, so we decided to hit the dance floor to avoid talking. Kent and I danced intimately, with his hands all over my backside. I couldn't help but glance around and notice the awkward looks from other partygoers, who then looked at your father for some clarification. He didn't seem to acknowledge our presence. One man in particular kept trying to insert himself into Kent's business, but your father told us to keep him at a distance. After about five dances, I excused myself to use the restroom and, of course, Kent followed me like an eager puppy. Once I finished and exited the stall, he lifted me up and placed me on the dressing table before kissing me and pulling up my dress. It was clear he had intentions of going further. Suddenly, a man barged into the room, his face clearly showing his desperation to use the bathroom. Embarrassed by our presence, he quickly turned and hurried out. I remember him well, a large man with a fiery red beard. If I recall correctly, he was Bishop Carling. Oh my goodness! This event even interrupted Kent and me in the bathroom. We turned to go back to the dance floor, but his impulsive desire took over, and he pulled me into the shadow of the trees. Our lips met, and he lifted the hem of my dress when suddenly a bright light shone on us, silencing everything around us. We quickly turned to see that all eyes were on us. We were at a loss. We had just returned to the dance floor when the man from the photograph tried to intervene calling me names despite my attempts to get him to leave us alone. That's when I noticed a crowd gathering around your father. They didn't seem pleased. There was a hint of accusation in her tone as she turned to Dave, raising her eyebrows. She recounted the events that led up to the bishop and the head of the school council asking about her wife's behavior. She made sure to clarify that she had not lied when she told them that her wife believed she had the right to do whatever she wanted with other men. I proceeded to tell him about the discovery of my wife's most recent infidelity and how she, along with her father, had threatened to ruin me completely. They even went as far as creating false evidence to use against me if I tried to expose their deceit. A smile crossed his face as he recalled the event. As I spoke, my sincerity was evident, and they could see that I was telling nothing but the truth. As expected, all the individuals in your father's company suddenly shifted their gaze towards me, sending hostile glares my way. The situation was incredibly uncomfortable. Looking back, I deeply regret my actions. The tension in the room was so thick it could have sparked a conflict. It's possible that the bishop wouldn't have mentioned what he witnessed in the restroom if you hadn't been caught under the security spotlight. I turned on, but then it abruptly ended. Nobody could believe that my usually proper and energetic wife would act in such a way. Within the next few minutes it seemed like every husband and wife in the room was hugging me. The commotion died down when a new cabaret performance started on the dance floor. Do you really have to mention this to them? It's not something I like to brag about. So what happened? The actress took a moment to collect her thoughts and recall the events that took place many years ago. Well, Kent and I were just enjoying ourselves on the dance floor when we noticed people whispering and exchanging looks. Before long, about half of the dancers had dwindled away. More and more eyes were trained on Kent and me. Suddenly, the little pest from your dad's photo appeared reaching for my arm and attempting to drag me away. 
I'd had enough. Swiftly I turned and delivered a knee to his nether regions. It was satisfying. In a move straight out of a movie, his eyes crossed and he dropped to his knees. He reached out to grab me, trying to keep himself from falling. Kent has always been a protector, which is one of the reasons I eventually married him. Without warning, he grabbed the man's hand and spun him around. He then leaned in and planted a kiss on the man's lips, causing him to fall backwards onto the ground. The man sat there, stunned, one hand covering his face and the other protecting his lower regions. The onlookers erupted into applause at the unexpected display of affection. It was a bizarre situation. I believe it was your ex-partner's significant other. Dave continued the story. His name was Alan. I may have spread the rumor that they were involved, which is why he kept meddling in our relationship. After that incident, the party quickly fell apart. Many of the guests came up to me and offered their help or support. One of the judges even advised me to consult my lawyer and look into the legal definition of mental cruelty. I simply told them to do what they felt was best. Alan was one of the last to go. As he hobbled away, I approached him and took out my anger and frustration on him before he left. Eventually, I found out that his employer had discovered the truth about the situation and let him go without making a fuss. He had been working there since he graduated from school, but they refused to provide him with a recommendation. The last I heard, he had relocated and was now working at a McDonald's restaurant. After that, my attention waned. Sarah directed her question to the actress. Did you watch any of this? Despite sticking around until the end, I never saw that unkempt man again. Your father reappeared and finally paid me the remaining amount he owed. I tried to ask him about the events of that evening, but he was too distraught and could only promise to explain it all someday. Kent and I left, but as we were walking away, your father's tears turned into a smile as he joked that I should have been an actress. Surprisingly, his words stayed with me, and two weeks later I applied to Nidu. My acceptance came soon after. As the saying goes, money talks. Now, I must call Kent. He specifically selected this piece while we were in Los Angeles. He requested that I update him on the story immediately upon hearing it. He promised to wait as long as necessary. As the actress rose to her feet, she said farewell. Goodbye, Sarah. I will be keeping an eye on your career. She added, If you ever find yourself in need of assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Turning to Wendy, she continued, And if you choose to follow in your sister's footsteps and run into any obstacles, know that you can always ask for my help. I am owed several favors at Nita. Mary, please take care of your husband and these two individuals. They are exceptional, each in their own way. Holding back tears, she faced the girls. According to your father's account, he had your well-being in mind and made the tough decision when facing difficult circumstances. When he apologizes and asks for your forgiveness, I recommend granting it without hesitation. She couldn't find the words to respond as her eyes met Dave's, so she simply embraced him tightly before escaping to avoid breaking down. The girls shared a wordless exchange, and then Wendy signaled to Sarah, who faced her father. No need for clarification, Dad. We hold no grudges towards you. Our biological mother is a distant memory. You were our sole parental figure during our time there. Then Maria came into our lives and showed us what a true mother should be like. The whole family stood up hugging each other. Despite his usual openness with his emotions, Dave cried openly in front of his loved ones. Thank you, he said, choking back sobs. I thought I was doing the right thing at the time, but you can never be certain, can you? He looked at his two daughters with a mix of emotions, pride, regret, and love. I don't know why I ever doubted myself when I have such amazing girls like you both. Radiant, self-assured, fit and knowledgeable. I must have made all the right decisions. Now, tears welled up in everyone's eyes. All three women praised Dave for being a perfect father. The waiter cleared his throat behind them with impatience. 
Dave's hands held a generous serving of cream caramel as he looked over at Mary. She met his gaze and shook her head, indicating that she hadn't ordered it. The waiter placed the dessert on the table and handed Dave a note. It read, Hard shell but soft sweet center. Dave passed the note to Mary, who chuckled with her signature sweet laugh. It seems that your tough guy act didn't work on her either. His ex-wife was lying in bed three time zones away from home, trying to fall asleep without disturbing the overweight man dozing beside her. After her divorce settlement ran out, she attempted to secure a teaching position in her new state without any references. After completing a three-month course in bridge building, she was finally allowed to teach but was only offered jobs in small schools located in remote areas. They paid the bills, but she longed to return to the city she used to call home. With the public school system out of reach, she had to resort to drastic measures in order to secure a spot at a reputable private school. The man sleeping next to her was the head of the board at an exclusive girls' academy, and if she could just get out of his bed without waking him, maybe he wouldn't try to have intimacy with her again before leaving. But even the thought of that made she has mouth feel dry. It was hard to stick to the plan sometimes, but she had to. Her goal was to land a job that would make her proud and allow her to reconnect with her daughters, who she desperately wanted back in her life. It had been fifteen long years, but she finally understood what truly mattered. She shifted onto her side, tears falling silently onto the pillow. And that's the end of the story. Thank you for your valuable time. Give me your generous likes. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. May the force be with you.